Hi, welcome to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be discussing PPAP, Production Part Approval Process. This video was recommended by Abhishek Deshpande. Sorry if I butchered that name. If you have any good ideas for a video I haven't done before, please leave them in the comments and I might make a video on that subject. What is the PPAP and why is it important? Like I said earlier, PPAP stands for Production Part Approval Process. It's used primarily in the automotive supply chain to ensure that a supplier and their production processes are able to meet the design and production specifications for the product required by the customer. Consider it a dress rehearsal for being in full production for your automotive customer. So it's the way to show your customer that you can make the parts they need to meet their requirements. A supplier that meets their PPAP requirements is able to ensure the products meet the customer's manufacturability and quality requirements, provide evidence that the customer engineering design record and specification requirements are clearly understood and are being fulfilled, and demonstrate that the established manufacturing process has the potential to produce the parts that consistently meet all requirements during the actual production run at the quoted production rate of the manufacturing process. It's all well and good if you can make a part that meets the requirements, but if you can't make it at the speed that is needed, then you are not going to be able to fulfill the customer's needs. This video heavily uses the Wikipedia page and the Quality One page for the PPAP. Something you'll notice throughout this video too is that many of the documents and processes in the PPAP are very repetitive and have strong overlaps with each other. This really ensures that a supplier is meeting the requirements for the customer's product. The PPAP has five different submission levels. As you'll see in the next slide, there is a lot to the PPAP process, so you don't do it all at once. Think of it like building a house. You start at level one, part submission warrant, PSW, only submitted to the customer. Then you add product samples and some data. Then you add product samples and complete data. Then the PSW with any other requirements defined by the customer. Then the final level, PSW with product samples and complete supporting data for review at the supplier's manufacturing site. There are many components to the PPAP. The Automotive Industry Action Group, AIAG, have a PPAP standard that is part of the broader Advanced Product Quality Planning, APQP, framework. This standard really encourages the use of common terminology and standard forms to document project status. And lucky for them, PPAP and its terminology is very common in the automotive industry, so they were successful. PPAP has so many detailed components that really each part of it could have a video dedicated to it. And, lucky for you, my channel, Beginning Engineers, does have videos on a few of these topics, so feel free to search my channel for those and you'll understand that each form in the PPAP has its own set of rules and processes to make. In this video, however, I'll give a brief overview of each part of the PPAP, its importance, and a general description of what it does. The components of the PPAP are as follows. Design record with all specification, engineering change notice, or number, customer engineering approval, DFEMA, process flow diagram, PFEMA, control plan, measurement system analysis, study, dimensional results, Record of Material and Performance Tests, Initial Process Studies, Qualified Laboratory Documentation, Appearance Approval Report, Sample Production Parts, Master Sample, Checking Aids, Customer Specific Requirements, and finally, Part Submission Warrant. It is a lot of components, and when bundled together, they make a massive document binder or several binders. At your manufacturing facility, you could have someone whose entire job is assembling the PPAP and making sure everything gets done. As a process engineer, I was responsible for some of the documents in the PPAP. Design records and ECN. A design record with all specifications is needed in the PPAP. The customer is responsible for designing, 
This is a copy of that drawing sent with the purchase order, the PO. If the supplier is responsible for designing the product, then the design will be released in the supplier's release system. Features on the design should be ballooned or road mapped to correspond with the inspection results, including print notes, standard tolerance notes and specifications, and anything else related to the design of the part. So what parts is this bullet talking about? Well, as part of the PPAP process, actual parts are produced, and these physical products have their features measured to compare against the design. Next, we have the Authorized Engineering Change Number, or Change Notice, commonly referred to as the ECN. This is a document that shows the detailed description of the change. It should be used any time an FFF change is made, a change that affects the form, fit, or function of the part. Customer engineering approval when required as part of the PPAP, the supplier must provide evidence of approval by the customer engineering department. Also, if required, pre-PPAP samples are ordered by the customer for on-site testing. The samples must be production intent and ship with a waiver so that testing can be done. So it's kind of like products before your sampled products. When testing on these parts is complete, the test engineers will provide an approval form for inclusion in the PPAP submission. They basically say these parts meet the design specifications. DFEMA, process flow diagram, and PFEMA. DFEMA, the design failure modes and effects analysis report, needs to be reviewed and signed off on by the supplier and customer. If you're not familiar with a DFEMA or PFEMA, I have a great video on the topic. They're very similar. One is for design and one is for process. Each one rates the severity, occurrence, and detection of a potential issue and how bad it would be based on a rating for each of those categories. After identifying your potential problems, you add up the total score for each failure mode and then you prioritize which risks should be guarded against based on the score. If the customer creates the DFEMA, they might not share the entire thing with the supplier. However, the critical design elements should be shared with the supplier to ensure they are accounted for in their control plan and PFEMA. You need a process flow diagram, which indicates all the steps and sequences in the fabrication process in an easy-to-follow visual diagram. That includes incoming components. And then you have the PFEMA, which is very similar to the DFEMA, except it focuses on process failure modes and their effects. But again, the same categories for how you rate the failure mode. Keep in mind that as your processes change or new processes are added, you should update the PFEMA. It's a living document. The PPAP should include a copy of the control plan, reviewed and signed off on by the supplier and customer. A control plan follows the PFEMA steps and provides more details on how the potential issues are checked in the incoming quality checks, assembly process, or during inspections of finished products, with the product and process characteristics noted. On this slide, I have a picture of Heister Yale's control plan, at least an example they have. And they say, until a process is capable, a CPK of 1.33, 100% inspection is required. If a process is capable, define a sample size and frequency that reflect an acceptable risk, and use Six Sigma tools and techniques to control the process. Measurement system analysis and dimensional results. MSA usually contains the gauge R&R for the critical or high impact characteristics and confirmation that gauges used to measure these characteristics are calibrated. Gauge r, r stands for Gauge Repeatability and Reproducibility, i.e. how the gauge measurements vary when performed by the same operator multiple times, that covers repeatability, and how the measurements vary when taken by different operators and equipment and labs. So switch any of those out. So reproducibility. How easy is it to reproduce these results if we switch the operator, we switch the lab, or we switch the equipment? And if you have the same operator with the same settings, how often do they get the same measurements? 
You want the repeatability to be high and the reproducibility to be high. You want variation on either very, very low. Because if you can't repeat your results and you can't reproduce them, then neither the supplier nor the customer would have any idea if the product or processes were actually conforming. You can't control what you can't measure. Of course, you will want dimensional results, a list of every dimension noted on the ballooned drawing. This list shows the product characteristics, specifications, the measurement results, and the assessment showing if this dimension is okay or not okay. Usually a minimum of six pieces is reported per product process combination. Many manufacturers do at least 30 pieces, however. Record of material and performance tests. The design verification plan and report DVP and R is a simple to use tool that documents the plan that will be used to confirm that a product, system, or component meets its design specifications and performance requirements. Each of the design specifications or product requirements are documented in the DVP and R form, along with the analysis or test used to determine if the specification or requirement has been met. Upon completion, the results of each analysis or test should be recorded in the report section of the dvp and form. The dvp and form is closely associated with the DFEMA, but each one serves a very different purpose in the product development cycle. The DFEMA is your what, and the dvp and R is your how. Basically, the dvp and R is a summary of every test performed on the part initial process studies, and qualified laboratory documentation. Initial process studies will be done on all the production processes and will include statistical process control, SPC, charts on the critical characteristics of the product. These studies demonstrate that the critical processes are stable, demonstrate normal variation, and are running near the intended nominal value. And that quote is from Quality One. Any labs that need to be involved for products, materials, process testing need the appropriate industry certification. And that's whether it's an in-house lab or outside lab. Next up in the PPAP, we have the Appearance Approval Report. This report is used for components that affect the appearance of the final part. This report is filled in by the customer and verifies that all elements of the final product meet the visual requirements of the design. So yes, we are literally talking things like, is the color right? Is the texture right? Is the shine right? You can see in this example from Donaldson that it can get very technical for how things look visually. Sample production parts and master sample. Sample production parts are sent to the customer for approval and are retained at either the customer's site or the supplier's site. And typically, these are the products that have their dimensions recorded as part of the dimensional results collected to validate the products meet the design specifications. A picture of the production parts is usually included in the PPAP, as well as a note on where the parts are physically located. Sample production parts are kind of like those little blocks of cheese you get that came from a much larger block. The sample production parts should essentially show that your processes produce this kind of part consistently. A master sample is a final sample of the product that is inspected and signed off by the customer. The master sample part is used to train operators and serves as a benchmark for comparison to standard production parts if any part quality questions arise. And that is another quote from Quality One. Essentially, I think of the master sample as your first edition. Once you know that you can make the products within specification, one of the early good parts made is your master sample. Next up in the PPAP, checking aids. More specifically, a detailed list of checking aids used in or by production. All tools used to inspect, test, or measure parts during the production and assembly process. So for all of these tools, the list will have a description of the tool and its calibration schedule should be on the list as well. It is really great when the tools themselves have a physical marking that allows any relevant employee to easily find that tool on the checking aid list. 
Examples of checking aids include check fixtures, gauges, models, and templates. MSA may be required for all checking aids based on customer requirements. Ideally, a high-performing supplier would want MSA done on all checking aids anyway. You really want to make sure your checking aids are doing their job. And finally, customer-specific requirements and part submission warrant, PSW. Customer-specific requirements are for anything the customer has as a requirement that cannot easily be captured in one of the previous documents. You would think with all the documents in the PPAP that every customer requirement would be captured, but as business and technology advance, there can be new specific requirements that have not yet been incorporated in an existing report. So this is like the catch-all for those requirements. The part submission warrant is a summary of the entire PPAP submission. A PSW is required for each unique product number unless the customer says otherwise, like if two parts are identical or nearly identical, for example. The PSW includes the reason for submission, design change, annual revalidation, etc., the level of documents submitted to the customer. So again, remember that the PPAP has those different levels. Declaration of part conformity to customer requirements. A section provided for any required explanation or comments. Supplier authorized person signature along with contact information. So essentially the supplier saying that yes, this PSW is legitimate, here you go. And finally on the PSW, an area for the customer to indicate disposition of the PPAP. And again, this is all from quality one on this slide. So we made it through the PPAP. There are many components to it, so if you are new to them, don't expect to understand all of them or have them memorized right away. The good news is Quality One, Wikipedia, and many other websites have good descriptions of the documents involved in the PPAP. And even better yet, you can search for any of the document names with document type colon PPTX, XLSX, DOCX, and essentially find actual documents that companies are using for the PPAP. So then you can take that document and have a living example for something in the PPAP, which you can reformat for your own purposes. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you now understand that the PPAP is a package of documents that a supplier can use to show their customer that they are meeting all of their requirements and delivering products that meet the expectations of the customer. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe, leave a comment suggesting a new video, or like this video. Have a great day!